Um, so now we're going to move on to Jennifer Foley, and I think that uh, it's going to be an interesting contrast. Uh, you know, as Coven says, he's he's just starting out a new kind of endeavor. It's a university museum. <clears throat> I'm not even sure. I mean, the collection scale I can imagine is different between these two institutions. Uh, but Jennifer is part of one of the more well-known kind of large-scale digital uh, initiatives, uh, Art Lens and also Gallery One, a whole bunch of really uh, fascinating initiatives that came together at the Cleveland Museum of Art and are things that a lot of us look at regularly um, for inspiration, for problem solving. Um, and so we look forward to hearing about all this. Uh, Jennifer Foley leads the interpretation department at the Cleveland Museum of Art, focusing on connecting visitors with the museum's collections and exhibitions through interpretive content for the museum's app. Art Lens, digital and analog interactives, audio and multimedia tours, and public programming. Prior to joining the CMA in 2012, she held positions with the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C., and National Endowment of Humanities, and she holds a Ph.D. in Southeast Asian Art History from Cornell University. Jennifer? Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, this pretty large project uh, that we've been working on at the museum for the last few years, um, and that the um, a big piece of it sits in the interpretation department. So it's one that I spend a lot of time on personally. Um, and uh, as uh, Kimon said, the, we had a project at the Cleveland Museum of Art, um, this Gallery One project, which some of you may have heard of, it's a, a space within the museum, actually a fairly large, what had been a special exhibitions gallery space um, that is uh, now focused on kind of the intersection of uh, art, technology, and interpretation. And uh, so this is a very large scale project. Um, the entire project took a very long time, uh, but there were a number of different iterations. Um, from start to finish, it was a decade, more than a decade. Um, but it went through a lot of different iterations before it got to the one that actually ended up being produced. Um, and this iteration uh, took about 18 months, which is actually a very, very compressed uh, sort of timeline. Um, one I might not recommend uh, if you <laughs> plan on doing. Uh, I mean, it's nice to have a deadline. That's really helpful. But um, 18 months is actually really, really compressed. And um, just because, you know, hey, who doesn't like a challenge, in addition to doing uh, the Gallery One project, uh, there was sort of a parallel project that had been going on, um, a prototype of uh, what was kind of being thought of as the replacement for the museum's um, older kind of outmoded audio tour. There had been a, a permanent collection audio tour. And um, so th there was a prototype that was done for moving it from being an audio tour to um, being something that would have um, images that um, the style would be a little bit different. Uh, and it was, the prototype was launched for a couple of galleries because also while we were doing the, these two projects, um, oh, the museum also decided to um, reinstall every single one of our collections and build uh, two new wings and knock down two old, you know. Because, hey, if you're going to go big or go home. So um, we had reinstalled a couple of uh, the collections over this. It was an eight-year process uh, to get all of the collections reinstalled. And uh, we had just in reinstalled the ancient collection, uh, the African collection, and early Christian collections. And so in those spaces had this prototype that was launched as a web-based app. Um, so that was sort of a parallel project that was going on uh, while the Gallery One project was beginning. And uh, at some point it was decided that actually these two things should kind of come together. Uh, and the prototype evolved into Art Lens. And so uh, as part of kind of on the same timeline as um, the Gallery One project, we were also working on creating this museum-wide app, uh, which, and here's a screenshot of what you see when you use it on an iPad. Um, so we launched our Art Lens at the same time that Gallery One opened. Uh, and so the, the first chunk of time that I was at the museum um, was this kind of like nonstop marathon to get to the, the launch of the app. Um, so we initially launched it for iPad, and uh, the, the way in which it's structured is that you sort of open it up and you get a map of the museum, and you see the, the blue dot that's on the, 
the map on the screen that we have location awareness uh, sort of software built into it. So um, it knows where you are. It tells you what in the gallery where you are, what is near you now that has extended interpretation uh, to kind of guide you through the spaces. Um, when we were thinking about what the structure of the app should be, we actually looked back to uh, audience research that we had done when uh, a couple of the uh, American galleries had been reopened uh, during this process of the reinstallation. And we did a, a multi-month uh, research project in which we really looked at what were the behaviors that people were exhibiting in uh, our gallery spaces. How were they using um, the didactic material that was in there? Um, and we found it was, what we found was reasonably typical for art museums. Um, nobody reads the panels, just so you know. Uh, it was a very, very low percentage of people read the panels. Um, and the most people, um, almost, the vast majority of people fell into one of two different behaviors. Um, some people wanted a very structured experience. They sort of wanted someone to say, here are the mo like 10 most important objects in the museum. Go see these. Um, but most people actually fell into a bigger category, which was what we think of as browsers. They walk in, they don't read the panel. They walk up to whatever object in the room is kind of calling to them. They read that one label. They skip the next 12 objects. You know, they kind of bop around the, the space. And so in thinking about the app, we really wanted to make sure that we incorporated those two main behaviors that we're, we were seeing with our visitors. And so if you look at the bottom, there's, there's kind of uh, two main sections, the near you now section and then the, the tours section. So tours is obviously for the, the people who want that kind of more structured experience. And Near You Now is really designed to be for people who are doing that browsing. So the idea is that you're standing in the gallery, the app tells you what Near You Now has extended interpretation. You can browse through that and make decisions about what you want to see that interests you. Um, so this is sort of, as you have it up, you get uh, the little we were, it was called a tray, that was the discussion, which is not a word that I think is great, but um, the tray opens up and tells you, here are the objects in the room that have extended interpretation. And it does, in the iPad version, it also pops up on the left-hand side. So you can kind of scroll through this and tap on whichever object you're interested in learning a bit more about. Uh, and that once you do that, you get an object page that opens up. Um, the image on the right is a high-res image. You can tap into it and zoom in and look at it in detail, or you can play uh, whatever videos are attached to this object. Um, I think one of the things that we really thought about in terms of the content development um, for uh, the, the app was we made a, a very conscious uh, decision to shift away from um, a more traditional audio tour structure. Um, so I don't, I don't, how many people here have ever like, taken an audio tour willingly? <laughs> wow, I'm, I'm actually amazed at how many, <laughs> you know, I'm actually amazed at how many people here have, because I mean, often when, when you ask people who, you know, are kind of involved in museums, everyone's like, no. Um, but <laughs> I mean, I think if you've taken an audio tour, they usually fall into one of two sort of styles in terms of the way it's put together. Either you get just the narrator, right, you get like a voice actor person who reads the entire thing, or in some places it might be the director of the museum, but there's one single person who is reading everything, or sometimes you get like clips of interviews interspersed with an actor who's reading like the, the narrative parts. And uh, we decided that we were gonna step away from both of those things. Um, all of the content in Artlands is uh, entirely from unscripted uh, extemporaneous interviews, and there's no narrator. So the idea was that we really wanted to have this sense of it's like having a conversation with somebody in the gallery, that you are there um, with the curator who gets uh, interviewed for, for all the objects, and you're kind of, it's like you're there listening to them talk to you, but you're not, you don't have that sort of intermediary of the narrator there to sort of bridge thoughts, which makes it really interesting in terms of making the content, um, because the, the upside of having a narrator to bridge thoughts is that they're there to bridge thoughts, which the person may or may not have actually done in the interview. So um, sometimes it can be a little challenging to put it together, but it was a really conscious decision to do that. Um, the other thing that we decided to do was uh, wherever we can get multiple voices added onto the content for the object, we do that. So that may be a scholar, it may be um, somebody who's an expert in a field that is um, kind of a different way of approaching the object. For example, uh, so we have a very large painting by Monet of water lilies. 
And so the curator talked about it, um, but I also had the curator of plants from the botanical garden come in and talk about water lilies because we have lots of people who are gardeners and they may look at the painting and be like meh about the kind of art historical stuff, but they might get really excited about the gardening aspect of it. Um, and then we also try to bring in community members whenever we can. So for like one example we have is uh, we have a mihrab, a, a prayer niche, um, is part of our Islamic collection, and we interviewed the imam from a local mosque who talked about what uh, a mihrab is and how it's used within the setting of a mosque. Um, so we try to have more than one voice uh, built into it. And part of that is in kind of a subtle way trying to signal to our visitors that um, there is more than one way to approach and appreciate the objects, um, and that it, there isn't just a right way um, which, you know, sometimes when, when there's just, there's only the label, then that feels like, okay, the label is the right answer. And so we wanted it to be that, oh, maybe there's more than one right answer. And so maybe whatever way uh, the visitor is approaching it, that could be a right answer too. Um, so we did initially launch it as just an iPad app. Um, and it, about 20 seconds after we released it as an iPad app, we started getting questions about when we we're going to do it for a phone. Um, and that became the next project. So um, we did move on. We did uh, iPhone first, uh, and then we did an Android version. Um, and in between, uh, we actually were able to address some of the things that came up with uh, the iPad version. Um, so for example, one of the things that, uh, that came up quite a bit uh, it was the second question after when are you going to do a phone version was uh, why don't you have a search function? So uh, in between the two, the going from the iPad to the iPhone, we were able to address that as an issue. Like, okay, people really want a search function. Like it really, really bothers people when they can't search. And, uh, and it's interesting because it was part of the discussion and the development of it. Um, and so I go back to this very compressed timeline. Uh, Gallery One had like an 18 month timeline. It was slightly shorter for Artlens. Um, and that when you have a very compressed timeline, you get to make lots of uh, choices about what you're prioritizing. Um, and sometimes what you discover later is like, oh, hey, hmm, I guess we really did need that. So uh, that was one of those, I guess we really did need that things. Um, but it's been, it's been sort of interesting seeing what happens because people have a very different relationship with their phone than they do with a tablet. Um, and so you sort of see people behaving slightly differently with the phone, which has been kind of interesting. And I think a lot of what we thought about um, with having an app was that we really wanted a way to kind of uh, help people like have this additional layers of content that people could carry with them through the, the galleries. Um, and so kind of the connection between having an app that has location awareness, um, that has content, and the, the gallery spaces is sort of a, a reasonably clear connection <coughs> between them. Um, but this was being kind of developed simultaneously with Gallery One. And I think one of the things that we thought a lot about is that we wanted to connect the Gallery One space, which is a physical space near the entrance to the museum um, that is uh, not actually connected to physically the other galleries in the building. Um, so how do you connect that space, the gallery one space, to the other galleries? You actually have to physically go out, go across a large atrium, you're going upstairs, or you're going into another building, another part of the building. So um, we wanted to try to, to find a way to connect those two spaces, and we wanted to do it digitally. And the way that uh, we attempted to do that was with the collection wall. So in um, the Gallery One footprint, there are several different spaces. There's a, a space called Studio Play that is designed for families with young children. There's the space that we think of as Gallery One proper that has a number of touch screens with uh, sort of interactive games on them and a lot of information about the artwork there. And then there's a third area that's called we call the collection wall. <clears throat> and so you can see these are both pictures of uh, people interacting with the collection wall. It's a 40-foot um, multi-touch screen that kind of goes back and forth between a couple of different ways of looking at the collection. So one, uh, you can see on the right-hand side, one of which uh, the, everything that is currently out is being displayed on the screen. So about 4,500 objects, plus a handful of other ones that we've kind of hand-selected and inserted in there. Um, and then it it will sort of stay on that for a, 
about a minute and a half, and then it will go on to these views that we think of as being kind of uh, selections or curated views, and they're uh, mostly thematic. So, uh, for example, this one's showing dance and music. We have other ones that are like birth and death, love, um, love and lust is one. So there are sort of things that are pulled out of the collection that fall into that theme. And it goes back and forth between these two things. Uh, and so you can go up, touch the, the screen, you see an object there that is kind of catching your eye, and you're like, what is that? You tap on it, and it'll pull up, um, as you can see on the right-hand side, kind of a larger image of that with a little bit of information about it. Um, so we have this wall. So how is this wall actually going to connect to the rest of the museum? I mean, you have this like connection that's like a conceptual connection of like, I'm seeing pictures of the collection, and then, oh yeah, the collection's over there. Um, and, but you need to actually, it might need to make more of a connection between them. Um, and so the, we did actually do that, which is, um, if you look here, we have these, these things here at the bottom. Um, we call them docks. And you can take your device with art lens on it, put it on the dock, and then the things that you uh, open up on the wall, if you favorite it, it basically slides down the wall onto your device. So now you have it on there, and you have kind of a list of the objects that you've selected off the wall. And going into the app, you can now open it up and find out where in the building it is. Oh, it's in Gallery 217. I can now go find the actual object. Um, so that's sort of the basic uh, things that were going on and how we were thinking about the, the spaces, the app, the galleries, and trying to con connect these things together. Um, but of course, you learn all sorts of things when you do these things because, um, you know, not everything works out exactly as you think it's going to work out. So you get you get a fair number of surprises. Um, so, for example, one of the uh, things that happens in the app is that for a selected number of objects in the the collection, you are able to uh, use the app to scan the artwork itself and pull up an additional layer of content. Um, so this is actually showing the scanning screen. Um, this person has held up their phone, turned on the scanning function uh, in the app, uh, held it up in front of our Van Dyke, and it recognizes the Van Dyke and then brings up additional layers of content. Um, and you can see these kind of little dots. So each of these, uh, if you tap on them, will open up uh, a little bit of text that's in addition. Um, and we try to connect them actually to that physical part of the object. So, um, for example, uh, I think, um, if I recall, so there's this point in this painting where you have the mother is reaching down to the child, and so we, we put a, a um, scan sort of dot on top of the hand between the child and mother coming together, and that has a, a thing about talking about the, the kind of what um, that connection in the painting, so kind of highlighting pieces of it. Um, and when people do this, and uh, you know, we see them sort of in the galleries and they, they get it to work and it comes up and it's like, oh, I get this additional information and people go, wow, and they think it's really cool. But it doesn't, um, that success is not guaranteed. Um, sometimes uh, because not everything in the collection is scannable. So a lot of times what happens is people go up and they try to scan something that isn't scannable. Um, or, um, they, they can't quite figure out exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Um, they tap the button for scanning, and they don't really know what, what it's going to do, and then it sort of has this aperture thing, and then they're like, wow, what is it doing? So um, we actually did a, a very uh, long uh, and large-scale evaluation of both Gallery 1 and Art Lens. Um, and so one of the things that we found was that with scanning, um, what the most common reason when, that scanning failed for the people that in the, the research project um, was that they didn't understand the purpose or method. So they couldn't figure out what it was supposed to do. Like it, we have this little icon um, and it looks it's like a little round icon, looks like kind of like a wheel. And they'd look at it and say, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And they'd touch it and they'd be like, wow, okay, I don't know what's going on here. Um, so uh, for example, this is a quote from uh, the um, evaluation and it's the the also part of the title of this talk is you know oh, what does this button do it's sort of like this person went around for a long time before they hit the button not knowing what was going to happen 
And then when it opened up, it's like it took him a little while to figure out what, what to do then. So I think it, this kind of goes back to some of what uh, Coven was saying about the idea of having it be like something that it, you can figure it out. It, it is something that um, is actually kind of filling something that they need and is connected to how to do it, right? So um, that was something that we kind of discovered along the way. And I think we're thinking a lot about how we've done a lot of things to try to make it more clear how that works. Um, but it takes a little time to kind of work through, well, I think we're on about our 12th iteration of icons in the galleries to uh, convey information about how, which objects have what going on. Um, one of the other things that has been a, actually a bit of a challenge is the collection wall. People really like the wall, um, but that docking feature, which seemed like this you know, fantastic solution for this issue of being able to get people out into the galleries, nobody knows what they're supposed to be doing with these things. I mean, like nobody. <laughs> And, and so this is, a, I like this picture because it's actually an older picture. And the reason why I know it's an older picture is because over here there's this like little rack of maps or something. And right now, um, so <laughs> this is actually, this must have been from very early on, like right after we opened Gallery One. And uh, so what initially happened is kind of what you expect, right? You're going to launch something, it's got new technology, it's things that people don't know. They're not going to immediately get it because they've never seen it before. It's not something that's obvious to them because they, it's, it's you know, completely unfamiliar. So we had people that were sort of standing around in this, in this area and in the main area um, kind of waiting to answer people's questions. Um, but then it was like the period of time in which they were having a hard time figuring this thing out kind of kept extending out. And so eventually, there's um, kind of off over here in the picture that you, you can't see, um, there is a, a some chairs and tables. And so eventually there were sort of people that were sort of stationed at the chairs and tables. Well, now we have this um, very large permanently installed desk over here because what we realize is that this is a thing that requires human interaction. It requires facilitation. Um, and that, so the way that people figure out how to dock is that there is a person that comes up and says, hey, can I help you? And then they walk them through the process. Um, and so that was something that, you know, you in these large discussions and you've got like, 40 people in the room kind of talking about this and people are very excited about it and it's going to be great. And then sometimes what you, you realize is like, oh, yeah, well, you know, it's not as clear or obvious um, to everybody um, that this like awesome idea that we have that we like kind of hid. Um, I think one of the things that in some of those discussions that as you're talking through things, there's a lot of, particularly in art museums where there is often kind of a design aesthetic in art museums, it's like very pared down. Um, that there is a desire for having things be subtle, that we don't, we're in art museums in particular, we're kind of afraid of being louder about talking about things or bolder about talking about things. So there's a lot of like subtle things and like implied things. And I think often when it comes to um, technology, particularly when it's new technology, we need to not be subtle or we need to be a lot less subtle because um, it doesn't, you know, people often won't get it, and then that ends up, that can be frustrating for people. So um, that, I think, is something that we're really thinking about uh, kind of as we move forward. Like, what are ways in which we can be clearer about some of these things? I think one of the things, though, that um, throughout this project, it's really uh, made me think a lot about kind of more um, philosophical stances, I think, about digital and museums and art and how we think about how those things come together or can come together or should come together. Um, one of the most common questions that I get uh, related to art lens um, is, are you, know, are you worried that people will look at the screen instead of the art? I mean, I get this question all the time um, from kind of the very, very beginning. And as an example of how this is at the very, very beginning, um, the first uh, newspaper article that was uh, produced, um, so this came out on January 20th. I think, if I remember, uh, the app dropped in the Apple Store on like the 14th or something of that month. So this is like a week later, we have an article in the paper, and um, you know, it's this concern of the screen is going to take the place of looking at the art or being with the art is kind of put out in this very first thing. And it, it happens all the time. I have, um, you know, we have groups of, of uh, students that come in from Case. We have a 
joint program with Case Western uh, Reserve University, and uh, I was asked to, to take a group of art history students through um, some of the permanent collection and talk a little bit about what interpretation is. And we got to the part where it was like, okay, do you have any questions? And the first question was, you know, I've got this undergraduate student who's like, don't you think people are just gonna look at the screens and not look at the art if you have this, um, this app? So this is, it is this kind of thing that comes up over and over and again, and I mean, it, I think it's part of a larger discussion <laughs> that's going on kind of in society about this sort of alarmist uh, sense that you know, we're, we're all just gonna kind of become people who don't talk to people because we have digital devices. Um, and so, I mean, I think that there is kind of a connection between these things, this concern of like, you're not gonna look at the art, actually parallels, you're not gonna look at your friends, or you're not gonna look at your family, or talk to or interact with humans because you've got a device. Um, that said, so I go back to this question, are you going to worry about, and this is that initial quote from uh, the newspaper followed up by the end of his article where he realizes that it actually made him look at something. <laughs> so so what's, what's really interesting to me um, is in thinking about this, um, as part of this uh, large scale evaluation, I am like super, super excited about one of the things that came out of that evaluation, which is that it actually succeeded in making many, many of the participants look more closely. So when people ask me if I'm worried uh, if people are going to look at the screen instead of the art, I get to say no. Um, and, uh, and I can actually back up why. Um, because our participants said it made them look at things. And they are actually quotes, so you get all kinds of like, um, like, it like made me like do this. <laughs> because we did actually do testing with real people. Um, so I think, you know, one of the, this kind of fear that the screen is going to take over or take the place of, I, and I, from the start, I felt like, I think this is unfounded. I don't think we're really going to move to a place where we're, you know, people aren't going to look at the art anymore because they have a screen. Um, but it's, it, it's really, really gratifying to then have um, data <laughs> to say, no, really, they're going to look at the art. It's okay. Um, but I think that this kind of keys into um, larger questions of, of um, kind of thinking about um, screens in the physical space, screens as that sort of intermediary, um, whether it's thinking about looking at uh, artwork on the web or looking at it through an app um, or doing both that and being with the art at the same time and, and what that actually plays out to be. And the thing is that these are not new questions. I know that you know it, it seems like sometimes they're new questions because we're talking about new technologies, but these are actually old, old questions and old, old arguments. Um, and you know, I think about, I often think about uh, Malraux and uh, his essay uh, on the, the museum uh, without walls, uh, La Musée Imaginaire, and you know, in this um, uh, sort of essay, he, he had put out this idea that he's very excited at the time about photography because through photography you can take a picture of a whole bunch of different artworks and then put them next to each other in ways that you wouldn't see in a museum that would never happen in their original context so that you can find new juxtapositions and new ways of thinking about this. And you know, he's very excited about this idea that photography gives you the possibility of essentially creating your own museum, your museum without walls. And uh, it can be done, he's in the process, and actually in this picture, of doing it through an art book. He's looking at uh, images that he's going to put together in this art book to create this kind of uh, wall-less museum. Um, but it's something that he really saw it as an advantage. Um, how, and so, you know, when, when I think about this idea of, you know, an art book is a museum without walls, this idea that, you know, through this you can have these really interesting juxtapositions that are surprising and can kind of prompt looking at things in a different way, in a new light, that that's a lot of what we were thinking about with the collection wall. That by being able to see the entire collection kind of right there as an overview, visually interacting with it, rather than 
you know, all of these objects in this space and then all of those objects in that space, um, that it might prompt some of those surprising juxtapositions. It might be a moment to say, oh, I'd never thought about that before. And we've seen some of that definitely happen with the collection wall. I think in particular, um, I, I, I think it's very interesting that when it comes to the collection wall, um, deck arts are the winner, which is really interesting because often in the galleries, they get lost. People go into the galleries and they walk through and they look at the paintings and I guess there's that case and it's got like a bunch of terrines in it, but they keep going. Um, but they'll see the terrain stuck in between 15 other things and you see people all the time walk up and open up ceramics. Like one of the things that was opened up so, so often when we look at the metrics was this um, box in the shape of a bundle of asparagus that no, I swear to God, no one had ever looked at in the galleries, ever. And it was like being opened over and over and over. There was something about seeing it in that space on the wall amongst things that were not like it that made people go up and say, what the hell is that? Boop, and they'd open it up. Um, so I think it can have some of what Malro was talking about. But of course, he's not the only person who's ever weighed in on this. Um, it, so some of you may be familiar with Walter Benjamin, who is kind of coming in, perhaps on the other side of this discussion, um, it, you know, about how uh, you, in not having that interaction with the original work of art, then um, you, you're, you're really losing the aura of the work. Um, so this quote here, so, um, you know, even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element, its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be, this unique existence of the work of art determined the history to which it was subject throughout the time of its existence. And of course, in this essay, he talks about this as being the aura, to which I have to say, oh, no, they be stealing my aura. Like, there is this real <laughs> concern, I think, and on the part of some people, this idea that the screen is going to take the place of that experience of the artwork, um, and that it's going to lose some of, like the artwork itself is going to actually lose some of its aura. Um, and so I can just imagine what kind of apoplexy this might uh, prompt in uh, Walter Benjamin if he were to see this idea that it's not just the mechanical reproduction, but digital reproduction makes a whole new world of reproducing possible. Um, and of course in this you, you also get to see all of the ways in which the color is misrepresented, which is really sort of interesting. Okay, so <laughs> I think part of, there is a sort of fear that like, right, like if, if you're looking at, at um, photographs, then, you know, you can be like a slob and lay on the floor and roll around in your pictures and that you're not actually experiencing the artwork because you're too busy doing this. And that obviously once we get into the age of digital reproduction rather than the mechanical reproduction, we're all going to be this, right? And that's how we're going to interact with art, um, which is obviously why it's given Benjamin a headache. Um, but I, I really wonder about why we're still having this discussion. I mean, it, it's something that it keeps, there must be something in the question that is really fundamental to how we think about art because it keeps coming back over and over and over and over again. Um, and so I, I did actually purposely pick this uh, particular work of art in part because I happen to like it quite a bit. But um, I, there's also what it is, right? Okay, there is also clearly what it is not because it tells you what it is not. It is not a pipe. It's a picture. Oh, but wait, right now this is a reproduction of this. So we're like now several steps away from the pipe. So, but it, there is this kind of parallel thing of, is it the artwork when you're looking at the screen in that reproduction, it's a reproduction, it's not the original artwork in the same way that this is not a pipe. Um, but is it really a question about whether or not it's a pipe or a painting or a reproduction or is it actually a question of whether or not what you're having is an experience? Um, so one of the things also that I, I find really interesting about um, the, the uh, Magritte piece is I actually can't remember if I've ever really seen it in real life. I, I, it bothered me enough that I actually did look it up and I think I might have actually seen it in a 1992 exhibition of uh, a retrospective of Magritte at the Met. I'm, pretty sure I did. I was living here at the time. I used to go to the Met all the time. It seems like something I would have done. I have a memory of a room, but who knows? Maybe I, I, I didn't, right? Like maybe I've actually only ever seen it, you know, reproduced. Um, but it doesn't mean I don't love it, right? Like I, I laugh every time I look at it. I think it's hilarious. Um, 
So I think this idea of experience, it, it kind of brought me back to John Dewey. And uh, thinking about Dewey's ideas about um, that the, the key to thinking about art and to thinking about um, interacting with art really is about having an experience, a real, what he calls a real experience, uh, and what I also think of as being kind of an authentic experience. Um, and so this idea that um, it's, it's something in which it has actually gone through the entire course of experiencing, that it becomes this kind of fulfilling, memorable uh, piece of life. Um, and that you know, he really um, makes a distinction between the stuff that happens all the time, you know, the things that you don't really remember, like, okay, I got up and I got dressed and I had breakfast or whatever, Whereas like the next day you might have breakfast where you bump into somebody that um, you haven't seen for ages and that, that turns that breakfast into an experience that is memorable as opposed to the one the day before that wasn't. That's just sort of like what a friend of mine calls flarn, which is the lint of life. Um, so this idea of having a lint, a lint, a real experience, um, it kind of brings us back to, again, the, the Magritte image, right? So I don't know if I've ever actually been in the presence of this painting. Because if I have, I don't remember the painting. So I must not have had a real experience with it if I don't remember it. But I remember the painting because I've seen it digitally. And I remember specific instances of looking at it. I remember the first time I saw a reproduction of it and processing it and then laughing out loud. So I think it kind of brings up this question of can you have a sort of real experience without being in the presence of the actual work of art? And I think it's one that's actually kind of an important thing, like can I have a real experience with these multiples? Can I have a real experience touching them on a wall? Um, and I, I mean, I think it's something that I, it's a question that I'm going to put out to you um, as I, I wonder about this. And I wonder, there must be something in that discussion because we keep having it. Um, but I feel like it may, my personal feeling is that I think it may be possible to have that experience without being in the presence of the work of art, which doesn't mean it takes the place of the experience of being with the work of art. It's a different experience. So that's the question I'm going to leave you with. was already on the experience very early on in, um, in your talk. And uh, because I'm reading a book, uh, do museums still need objects? Because in yes. some ways, they become about the conceptual idea of the objects mm -hmm. rather than the objects themselves. Um, but I think it is, this isn't really a question, I guess. It's a, just a conversation, part of the conversation. Um, but I think it's our, our, our job to, to create these experiences, whether they're through the digital devices or through the physical yeah. objects. Um, but, but I guess I do have a question. That was about evaluation. So you started mm -hmm. off by saying that um, in your early evaluation, you notice that there are browsers. You know, mm -hmm. people pick and choose what yeah. they want to look at, and they're not really reading. So what is it about the digital device that encourages them to read? And is there something we can do in the physical space without the digital mm -hmm. that would encourage them to read? Um, because they are reading if they're enjoying the, the digital device. And I guess I'm just wondering if you've done the evaluation on both sides, whether there is a pickup in um, that kind of di reading engagement. Um, so I would say they may not be reading because we have videos. So um, <laughs> we do also have the text, so it's the, the, um, the chat label is in there. And I, one thing that's actually that I didn't mention that is sort of important to think about in terms of that is that um, half of our user sessions are happening off-site. So for half of the people that are experiencing it, yeah, it's kind of not what we expected. <laughs> it's a little crazy. Um, so for half of the people that are using it, they're, they're not in the physical space. And a lot of the downloads, um, so the majority of the downloads are happening in the US, and the majority of those downloads are happening uh, in Ohio. Um, and then 
there's a majority within that that's happening in Northeast Ohio. So there are people who are like sitting at home in Northeast Ohio looking at this stuff. Part of it is that we think some people may be doing planning for a visit, and some people, um, we hear anecdotally that people get into the gallery, they see their slide videos, they listen to one, they say, I'll watch the other ones when I get home, and so maybe some of them are. Um, and the usage pattern seems to support that as a possibility. Um, so the, the wall text is there, the chat labels are there, which I think is actually important for the, the half of people who are not on site because they don't have it on the wall with them. Um, but I do think that one of the things is um, the goal of the app wasn't necessarily to prompt uh, more reading. So uh, in the evaluation, we didn't look at that thought because that wasn't sure of where we were going. Um, I think, and I think the thing is that also there are different people who engage in different ways, right? Like, we totally have people who are like, I want to read the label. Um, but we also have people that are like, ugh, I don't want to read the label at all. Like, they, you know, for them, they may just want to look at the painting. They may want to listen to a video. They may want to come to a public program. They may want to go on a tour. They may want to have their experience facilitated in some way. They may just want to hang out with their friends and stand in front of a painting and, like, talk about it. Um, and so I think some of what we thought about with the app was just, are there other ways that we can kind of um, facilitate an experience for people to have in the galleries by providing other entry points and other layers of content? So thinking about those um, videos, you know, in a chat label, there's all kinds of things that you wouldn't talk about because, first of all, you run out of space, right? And so you're trying to get, like, the main big things out there. But you might have an object that has, like, an awesome provenance story or that there's a great um, story about the artist and you can't fit it on the chat label. Well, now that stuff is in the app um, or how it's made. And so for the person who's really into how is it made, it gives them the opportunity to give that, get that information without having to have it be in a label that would then be like a novel on the wall. Can, I'm sorry, can I just follow up with, um, were you having any problems communicating the apps um, existence mm -hmm. to encourage it to be downloaded and do you know whether people are downloading it in the museum or at home? Uh, it gets downloaded in both places. We actually can see that that's happening. Um, more downloads happen off-site, but it, it does happen in both places. Um, that said, I mean, I, you know, it's it's an app and not everybody wants to have an app on their device and not everybody has a device with them and, you know, I mean, I think it's not like we, it's not like 80% of people coming in the door have the app and I'm not sure that, that would necessarily be a goal. You know, I mean, I think we, we've had, uh, I actually don't know what the metrics are now. I mean, it's the downloads are in the tens of thousands. The user sessions are like, I, the last time I looked, I think they, they were in the hundreds of thousands, pushing a million. So like, you know, we know it's getting used. And so I'm like, win. So, um, so you're talking about um, like different ways for visitors to experience the mm -hmm. museum, and I was wondering if, like, in your discovery period, if you considered like you know um, accessibility, like you know people who have a problem experiencing things mm -hmm. as they currently stood, mm -hmm. um, and if you addressed that at all. Um, I wish I could say that we addressed it in a more direct way. I mean, I think that uh, we have heard from some people that. Um, it has been good to have, uh, like for example, when we do the videos, we usually try to have at least the, the main segment is what we think of as a guided looking. Um, and so sort of saying, you know, if you, if you look here, you'll see this, if you look here, you'll see that. And so we've heard sort of anecdotally that that um, has been somewhat helpful for uh, people with vision impairments. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things is like we really wanted, to, like it, ideally, we would have closed captioning on all the videos. Ideally, we would have a lot of other things that, um, despite the budget, ended up not um, being built in in ways that I think we're thinking about are the things that we can do now moving forward um, for sort of next iterations. But So I wish I could say more than that, but I can't. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. It's fascinating. I, I'm curious as to if this, if the mobile app and, and Gallery One has replaced the use of screens in other galleries, I don't know if there has been previously, typically before the rehang, but traditionally you do see slideshows, videos, all the content that you're now putting on the mobile app, you know, on individual screens, and as you watch visitors, they'll, you know, they kind of run to the screen, you know, like flies to the light yep. sometimes. Um, so I'm curious how that thinking has gone, um, and also if you have temporary exhibitions. 
how the mobile app is used for those, if it is. Okay. Um, so for permanent collection, um, there were a couple of galleries prior to the reinstallation that did have videos. Um, I actually wasn't, when they got taken out, I wasn't at the CMA, so I don't know what they are exactly. They've been described to me in so many different ways that I act at this point, I really have no idea what they were. I mean, they, they're called interactors, and other ones are like, well, that, they were movies. And there's like arguments in your, like inside the museum about what they were. Um, and they, they did not go back out. Um, and some of that was like, for example, there's one in particular in a collection uh, that the loss of which is much lamented by the, the curator. And I think the thing is that the technology, like by the time that curator got to the museum, it had already been there for a long time. So it was like the technology was outmoded at that point. Um, and so at this point in the permanent collection, we don't have anything in the galleries. But it's interesting that you asked that question because we've, um, it, literally in the last couple of weeks, this has come back around as a discussion that we're having about there may actually be some galleries where we're looking at it, potentially installing something, thinking about producing something that would um, be in addition to what's going on with the app. And actually that curator in particular, the one that is sad about the loss of that um, video, is very pro art lens because he feels like this is getting some of this material back into the gallery, but because not everybody uses art lens, we get back to like, if we really want everybody to have access to this, then you know maybe we need to think about something that's being installed in the gallery. So we're sort of starting to have those discussions again. And I already totally forgot what your second question was. Oh, okay. uh, temporary <laughs> exhibitions. Temporary exhibitions, thank you. Um, also an interesting question. So uh, the way that this was structured, initially the um, location recognition uh, software, it, so it wasn't structured to be able to work in our gallery, the special exhibition gallery space, which is in our basement. Um, also, if you're going to build a gallery, don't put your special exhibitions in the basement. Nobody finds it. It's just an FYI. Um, but, uh, so initially it wasn't really thought of that. And part of that has to do with the discussion about rights, um, which was such a huge part of the process for this and is also super expensive. Um, and so doing... Um, like to create the videos in here is uh, we do them in-house so and that, that was sort of a long journey we went from a um, partially out of house to a collaborative with an outside to a entirely in-house process so uh, and for that um, there's a team of three of us that work on this um, and it's part of the job of those three people so there's nobody that works on it full-time um, so it takes quite a long time to get because uh, it's um, video slideshows, so there's, you know, you record the interview, you cut the interview, you know, the scripting is all this stuff. That in it. So right to this huge, big issue with the permanent collection. So we hadn't initially touched any of that in special exhibitions, but we just opened an exhibition in February uh, in which we did a separate app for that exhibition um, in order to carry the... Um, we decided not to do an audio tour. We did a multimedia tour that included filling people in Africa, because like I said, go big or go home. <laughs> like, you know, we, we don't do a whole lot of half measures. <laughs> I get very excited about things, and I'm like, let's just do this. So, <laughs> uh, and so we have, we actually, this is our first time trying this. We have an app that um, is now doing some of this for the, the permanent collections, or the uh, special exhibition space. and. Um, one of the ways that we got around the rights issue is that the um, the tour part of the app, uh, the content is only available when you're on our Wi-Fi system in our building. So you can't get to it outside. And then at the end of the exhibition, the app blows away, disappears from your phone. So we were kind of able to get through some of those rights discussions by saying, all right, they're never actually going to have the stuff on their phone. Yeah. I'm actually curious about um, the content that's in the app. How much of that is mirrored on the website, or how much of it is content that might, you know, earlier have been on the website, and maybe to what extent are apps replacing what might formerly have been a website experience, or visitor <coughs> expectations driving that? Mm -hmm. um, the style of the content is different from what had previously been on the website. So I think in kind of going through the process of creating it, we were all of us, including the sort of marketing and communications team, who are the ones that create most of what's on the website. 
Um, we all thought of them as being very separate because they felt very different. Um, since we started doing this, there, there have been, we don't mirror very much, um, but since we started doing this, there are times when um, like our social media uh, person will say, you know, can, can we use a couple of the videos from our lens uh, for a blog or for, you know, um, like Museum Week uh, was uh, last week or two weeks ago, I blog track. Um, but the, we have a tour that we did, a multimedia tour that we did, of, um, that we actually change out every six months of staff picks. So I interview people from all over the staff, um, every department, to talk about what their favorite object is. And for one of the days, the theme for the day, the Museum Week was favorites, and so she posted a whole bunch of our staff picks videos. So we do some of that, but it's, um, I don't know that it's replacing. I mean, I think that there's sort of different experiences. I think you want different things if you're sitting at home looking at your computer versus like, I'm on my phone. Um, so there's places where there's a little bit of overlap, but I, I think in some ways they're still different. And we actually do create in my department um, videos that are designed specifically to go to the website, and we think of them as very different, and the style is different as well. Yeah, I, well, yeah. I, I guess I guess part of my question is maybe it's too early to you know really get the metrics back on this is whether or not visitor expectations mm -hmm. and visitor needs are better being served by by apps and by having that sort of you know that sort of in your home experience rather than you know something that they might go to the website for. Yeah, I think they said um, I think it's apples and oranges because um, I think that your expectations in the building are different from your expectations at home. Um, and I also think that things like attention spans are different. Like I I will watch something that might even be whole two, two and a half minutes when I'm at home. <laughs> and you know, at 60 seconds standing in the gallery, I'm starting on like, ha, ha, you know, so like, I, I think some of, there's those sorts of things. So I mean, I think in that way, they're a little, it's kind of difficult to make the comparison. Mm -hmm. And then think about what the expectations are, because I think their expectations are different, depending on what the circumstances. Yeah. Jennifer, I had a um, question first, I, just an observation that you know, artifacts in museums weren't always labeled. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the conversation about digital stuff is a little bit like the anxiety that was produced by feeling the need to put a paper label mm -hmm. up next to it. So that conversation, my guess is, will go away in, in the in the long run. I don't think. I mean, well, nobody's debating. <laughs> I mean, you know, but nobody's the third. It's not. It's not a. I have not noticed in the museum blogs a great deal of discussion or discourse about the value of a paper label next to an object. But my question is this, in your visitor studies um, uh, evaluations is, did you add in um, a comparison with a tour with a docent and or curator? In other words, how do visitors rank the experience of going through the museum solo uh, with an mm -hmm. electric tour guide, mm -hmm. uh, you know, gadget with with a person, and I, I wondered if there's any experience or way in which to compare those experiences for visitors. Uh, we didn't ask that question, and it was. Um, I mean, part of it had to do with um, the focus of the evaluation was really on what was happening with the app and thinking about how is the functionality working, how, what was the experience of trying to navigate it, was it intuitive, um, and did, you know, how, what were the, their reactions to the content. So at the, and this was uh, an evaluation that went on for, between that and Gallery One, uh, they spent almost two years doing it, and they really, the focus was really on that. Um, so the question wasn't asked, but I'm also sort of like, I'm not sure that I would ask it, because I think we think of them as serving different purposes. That, um, because it's sort of like one of the first questions after are you afraid that the screen is going to make people not look at art? Um, and this came from our docents in particular, is like, is this replacing us? Like, is this replacing the experience of being with a person? And I'm like, hell no. Like, these are different things. And so I, I'm not sure that, like, I'm not sure what I would do with the well, information do the, docents, the ranking. do the docents use the apps they do. with their tours? Not on their tours. No. They use it words, for research. But I'm, I'm just curious as to whether, so when I teach now, I co-opt my students. I make, they're, they're all with their laptops and phones open, mm -hmm. so I make them look things up in the course of my talk. I can't remember that, look up that date. I, I can't, look, please look this up. You need to look that up. I mean, sure. I just. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, engage them that way. And <laughs> There's a couple of doses that we use in Montours, but it's only a couple. Yeah. Um, they, I mean, I've trained them on how to use it so that they know how, but mostly they're using it for their own um, kind of research purposes so that they can learn more about the object. I, I've been dying to do this experiment, so I've just wondered if anyone else had. Do people ever use our lens while they're on a tour? Like while they're on a, a like dosing They get the dose and then they get the thing and they're I don't think so. I've never seen it. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. But I've also not had any docents say they were using it on my tour. And I suspect that they would tell me if that happened. I think, <laughs> think Deborah's point is interesting. It's like, you know, like they are totally different. But like, but how do you compare this. apples to oranges and, and from the content right. perspective? Because. Well, and that's it. Is it's, I mean, that's why I say, like, I'm not sure what yeah. I would do with that information. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not sure how I would well, I use that. <laughs> well, I'm interested in um, visitor expectations mm -hmm. and satisfaction. And, like, did they have a great museum experience? And when we've done our visitor surveys, we don't have a, any kind of acoustic guide tour. Mm -hmm. But when people have been on, had, a, had an encounter with a staff person, a volunteer yeah. docent, or whatever, the visitor satisfaction just skyrockets, sure. um, you know, really high on the, on, on the charts. And absent that, you know, the numbers are significantly lower. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm just sort of no, I mean, I, I curious see, I as to your, where, the, right. where they I, all fit together. I think it goes back to your, your visitor expectations. And I think that visitors also do not anticipate that a device is going to be a stand-in for a human. So I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not sure that they would see it as this versus that, um, but more like this or that, you know what I mean? And so I, so I don't know. I mean, I, it's something to think about. I think, back here. Uh, um, I have a kind of logistical question. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned that um, you had started out with an iPad and then moved to the <coughs> So uh, it's a two-part question. One, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the difference in how visitors were using the devices and how that changed things. I'm sorry, how visitors what? Um, how visitors were using the device, the different devices, and how that how that changed things, both in the galleries and interaction with objects. And also, if the iPads have been rentals, perhaps, and then this is now a change from rented devices, which is kind of what an audio guide is to a mobile app, mm -hmm. that visitors, you know, it's their own phone. And if that changed things as well, um, you know, again, logistically for staff handing it out, it's just sure. those kinds of, of moving parts. Um, so from the launch, uh, it was always an app that you could download onto your own device. It was just that you could do it on an iPad initially, and then it was available for iPhone and Android devices. Um, we did also, uh, and we still continue to have iPad rentals for anyone that uh, doesn't have a, a device or doesn't want to download it on their device. It's a fairly large um, download, so a lot of times people are like, this is too big, I don't want it on my phone. Um, and so, I, I mean, not a lot has changed in terms of the logistics of that. I mean, we kind of got, uh, it was a little bit of an eye-opening experience, I think, when we initially launched it. Um, so it, we started renting out the iPads when we opened Gallery One, which was in December of 2012. Um, the app uh, dropped in the Apple Store in January of 2013. So there was this little piece in between where it was only available through rentals. Um, I think when we, in a lot of our discussions, and you look at the demographics of our museum, which um, I, I am very happy to report, has we have actually had a shift in demographics in the last couple of years, where uh, we now have the younger audience than we had previously. Um, families with young children, uh, we went from, I think it was like 9% of visitors to 29%. 12% to 29%, and there's a combination of things that we think it's contributed to that one major factor being gallery one, um, but there's also sort of changes in some programming. And then our average um, age has actually dropped, so even the adults, we're getting younger adults. We're also still getting our more traditional audience, which is where we were at the time uh, when we were kind of talking about launching this. And our traditional audience is kind of the traditional audience of most art museums, uh, trying is older and female. Um, and there was a lot of sort of um, anxiety around like, oh my God, are they gonna, like, are they gonna know how to do this? Are they gonna have their own device? Like we should get a million iPads to rent out because nobody would have them, you know? And uh, I think we got like 70. And um, they really, we've never had a huge number of rentals because mostly what ended up happening was that everyone that came in, including our traditional visitors, 
said, oh, you have an app. Let me get my iPad out of my bag. <laughs> so what we, we got a little schooled on that, which was interesting. Because um, they <coughs> Skype their grandkids. Because yeah. they Skype their grandkids. There's a lot of FaceTime yeah. action going on. Um, and I mean, it's, it actually has been really interesting. And this was, you know, this was a few years ago. We really thought they're not going to be. Like, we totally got school. Um, so, so that's sort of like an interesting thing. I think one of the, the, we're not seeing like a huge shift in behavior between the iPad and the iPhone. I think the big difference is um, there is like people come in, they find out we have an app. Um, <clears throat> if they didn't bring their iPad with them. When we only had the iPad one, they'd be like, oh, I'll do it later. It's a lot easier to say, oh, well, we have this for iPhone and Android. And they're like, oh, in their pocket, pull out the phone. So I think you get, it's a little easier to get that kind of conversion to having somebody do it on their own device um, with the phone because it's something that you know, we usually have with us and you don't necessarily always bring your, your tablet. Um, thanks for your talk. I really love how you historicized it for us a little bit about this before the digital, um, these questions, which is really great. Um, but I guess my question is that both of these presentations seem to, uh, digital has come at times when both your institutions are sort of rethinking things. Mm -hmm. One, uh, the blend in it seems almost like organizational psych psychology, right? We're trying to get the staff you know, more savvy. Um, and think about our resources long term in that way, our staffing costs, our staffing and personnel. And then at Cleveland, it seems like it came with major infrastructure changes in this huge gallery um, project that was initiated. Um, and so I guess, you know, in so much discussion of change, is the goal just to be agile? And where have you started to see this already, in, you know, in things like budgeting, for example, or um, you know, obviously it took like a massive pull of resources to get this off the ground, but now do you sort of see um, almost kind of a, a flatlining of how resources are used for for the app? Um, and sort of even just in the museum, sort of has the attention sort of shifted to it be integrated? And, um, and then also thinking about Agile in terms of, um, I started downloading the app at the start of mm -hmm. the, Q&A, Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wi-Fi has to be fairly stout for that yeah, to work out. Well. Um, so if, if, there, if it's, you know, in a place where there's other people also using the Wi-Fi, then that would So like Wi-Fi at Cleveland, is it we had, very top-notch, for example? So it's, like it's how? pretty stout. Okay. Um, and so I think uh, when it was initially launched, the download time was really, really long. Um, there's been a lot of optimizing that's gone on. So now what we're seeing on site is that the average download time is about four minutes. Uh, three or four minutes, which is still like an eternity. Um, <laughs> however, have we got No, we have it. We have it. And for a lot of there's a bunch of that's a long schedule. <laughs> but um, I mean, when I will tell you the reason why it's so large is that it's actually downloading all of the large images. images. Yeah. It doesn't download the videos on stream, um, but the, all of the high res images for every object that's in there and every object that's out is coming into your phone. So that's why it takes forever. But that's sort of the idea of <laughs> so, uh, being agile at an institution, though, right? Because you're, you've had to sort of make a lot of structural changes to be able to support that. There's a lot of structural changes, and that, it's right? kind of perpetual. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, and I think that is one of those things where you sort of have to be committed to the idea that, like, it's like what you're saying about, like, the, the attitude about websites has been, you do the website, and it's like, you know. And the thing is that when it comes to these projects, there is no moment of this ever. <laughs> and you have to know that when you start. That like, you will join the revolution and the revolution will never end, right? So like, this is just part of what you do now. And, and it's definitely that for, um, you know, like my department, my team, like we, we had this initial huge push to get um, a, a bunch of content into it when we launched. Uh, when, when we launched in 2012, there was like, I want to say it was about seven and a half or eight hours of content. Our average segment is 90 seconds. So um, eight hours, 90 seconds each. Now we have about 23 hours of content in there. So averaging 90 seconds. So between launch and now, we've been added like another 15 hours of content. So, and in fact, I have a whole list of videos that I need to review at the end of the day because it's still something that's going on. Can I add? 
from the curatorial perspective, so I understood that we spoke a little last night, that you're the director of interpretation, but, you know, I think, um, obviously, Anne asked about temporary exhibitions, which usually have a kind of narrower focus and a, a you know, narrative to tell. Working within a collection, so just the permanent collection, um, you have so many different ways to approach the object. So who is making that decision? Are you working with each curatorial department to decide, like, this one, as you said, has an interesting provenance. Let's tell people about that. Or this one was made out of some weird material. We can... Yes, we've, we've had both the weird material and the weird provenance <laughs> discussions. Um, I mean, we have like role plays in the, ex in the collection, so hey, I can have weird material discussions all the time. Yeah. <laughs> role plays. So, oh. you know, we got like finger parts in our collection. Yeah. So, like, you know, I mean, I think it is, so like a lot of the discussions that um, we would have uh, with uh, curators would be like, you know, trying to select out which objects we should do. Um, and there would be sort of the, you know, the curator might say, well, I want to do this object, uh, this object, we might give a list. Um, we would have a discussion with lots of people in education who spend a lot of time on the floor with visitors and say, you know, what are the things that you're seeing that people gravitate toward? Like, when you take them on a tour, when you take a bunch of kids on a tour, when you did, like, when you have a class going in, like, what are the things that people like? <gasps> and, like, so, I mean, there are certain objects that we know people gravitate toward. Um, you know, we talk with visitor experience about it. We talk with a lot of different people about, um, what sort? Which objects are things that we should select? So there was kind of a um, a lot of voices in the discussion about which objects, and we want to kind of a combination of things that are like that the obvious ones, like hey, we have this giant Monet painting that I mentioned earlier. It's part of a giant triptych. You can it's so big that you can see it from the atrium through the glass door on the second floor. So yes, we're going to do that one. Um, but, you know, picking out the things that are sort of the, the obvious ones, the ones that are visitor favorites, the ones that are, are historically important, and then trying to find some gems that you kind of end up pointing people at some of the pieces that people often walk by, um, by putting content in there that kind of steers them in the direction of like, oh, hey, maybe I should look at this. Um, so there were a lot of kind of discussions about that. In terms of what actually happens in the videos themselves, um, they're pretty free-ranging interviews. This is actually one of my favorite parts of um, the job, is that I get to interview like everybody. And so I get to learn all kinds of really interesting stuff about the collection, about you know, uh, artists, about the cultural context, about all kinds of stuff. Um, and so we'll have, you know, for that 90-second interview, or 90-second segment, um, you know, we might have three 90-second segments. There's probably an hour of material that uh, we had to go through to get there. And so some of it is, you know, we're just talking. And it's like, you know, the, I'll always start with, you know, something along the lines of like, just introduce me to this object. Or, or something like, all right, imagine you're in the gallery with your Aunt Sally who knows nothing about art. How would you introduce this to her? How would you tell her about it? And have people just start talking and ask follow-up questions. And you never know what places it's gonna go from there. And so then we'll go through and kind of pick out like, all right, we have the guided looking thing, the kind of introduction of how to engage, like what's your sort of first engagement step with this object, how do you look at it? And then we'll say, oh, they, but they told this great story about the provenance, we're totally using that. Or, you know, they have this great story about this weird material that's in there. So, um, so the app came out uh, in 2012, but you probably started strategizing for it, say 2010 or earlier. <laughs> well, well, would you, it, because of, huh? <laughs> or later? <laughs> well, I guess my question is: so, it, it, given the amount of time it takes to download the app and the resistance to people putting apps on their phone, if you were to do this project today, would you do a mobile website? No. No. So, and why? Um, there's functionality that you just can't get from a mobile website, and we had a lot of these discussions actually, because uh, certainly a, a web app was a possibility at the time when we were thinking about it. And we just, going through a lot of those discussions, we ultimately got to the place of like, for what we want this to do, it really needs to be a mobile app. One or two points of why? Um, I think the, if I recall, uh, I mean, some of these are, are also questions that are actually not my department. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to get too deep into the weeds because I could just be lying to you. Because um, I, I, a lot of this stuff, I don't exactly know what the issues were, but um, I think that a lot of the location recognition bits required 
um, it being an A of F. So I'm going to ask a closing question. Yes. I'm going to call you out your use of Benjamin a little bit too. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, so he does talk about aura and presence a lot, but mm -hmm. he's having that headache because he's ambivalent about the technology, really, you know? Um, and he's I not think. sure, like, he loves the aura and the presence. He's a, a mind from the 19th century, but he's keenly aware of the impact of the technology in the 20th century. Sure. And so he ends the essay talking about the fact that society is not mature enough to technology to <laughs> deal with um, things yet. And that's, that's what's giving us a lot of fascistic war, right? right. And he calls for a proletarian use of technology. Yeah. And I think what, it's, it actually reaffirms the, the quotes you put from the newspaper articles that like we're still anxious about a lot of these technologies yes. um, and, and we're not, we're actually maybe not culturally mature sure enough to realize it. So my question to lead into that would be, what can't we do yet with the technology or what can we do you, have, have, you haven't employed it that you would do to make this better, like to better serve uh, all of those concerns? Like how would you make it more nimble and more you reach a wider audience and to <coughs> maturify the, the society using it? Yeah, that's a great question, but I don't know if I can answer. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a really good question. And actually it's a great question to be asking right now because we're sort of at this point yeah, where exactly. we're looking at the next iteration of some of these things. Um, and I, I what kinds of things are you talking about at least in that? Well, I, and I think that some of so some of my thinking right now, like as you're asking this question, like I, I, mean, I might have to mull over this and get back to you in a while because okay. I think the thing is that I think a lot of where my my framework is right now because we're having these discussions is very specific to looking at like like the thing with the collection wall. We're like, all right, people can't figure out this thing about docking. How do we fix that? So like, I'm very focused, and as a group, we're very focused on this thing of like. The things, that, the very specific things we're trying to address, and so, but your question that you're asking is much bigger. I mean, I think it's, there's in, a, a, in, an interesting kind of combination of what that needed the specifics, and then your kind of holistic organizational change. Like, a, and how do you, how do we push these things beyond the like, oh, how do we get that button to work? Because uh, yeah. there's that next stage of the digital media that right. we're, it's, we actually even haven't designed, I think, a, a large amount of what this medium can do, and how do we get the best out of it? I think it's totally true, but I actually think it goes back to the question that uh, Deborah asked you, um, this thing of, like, making these arguments for having this stuff in there. And as that discussion was going on, I was sort of thinking, like, oh, you know, I mean, this is something that we talk about. And I mean, as you pointed out, we're lucky that we're in a place that we had a budget, and, you know, you can do things like once you, we had a donor, and so, like, once you get a budget, it's gonna happen, right? So like some of these arguments are things that I you know we didn't have to deal with, which is great. But I also think that some of the argument for having that space carved out is actually connected to your question, which is I think a lot of times we get into this thing where we're just ooh, 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 you're kind of burning through and then when it comes time to look at it again, you do get focused down the weeds. I need to fix this button. I need to you know and that there's Never, for many of us, there is not built into the process reflection. Mm -hmm. And that we need that space to reflect so that I can actually think about the bigger questions, about these bigger implications. And that having the space for reflection is ultimately going to make better stuff. And so the reason why you need <coughs> blog post time built into somebody's job is because it is sort of like forced reflection. <laughs> and while that doesn't sound great, it's actually something that, I mean, it's it's interesting, I was also thinking about, like, um, so I've been thinking in the last, like, year a lot about creativity and how that can prompt a lot of other types of thinking to have a little space to carve out, like, time to be creative. Um, and, and so, like, I had, one of my uh, New Year's resolutions last year, so this is really sad, was that I was going to, like, build time for creativity, which I totally didn't do. <laughs> like, because it's like every time that, you know, you make these promises to yourself, I'm going to be more creative because I need to work like that. And then six months later, you're like, I have done none of this. Because every time you're like, I, I'm going to do that next week. And then someone has a deadline, you do this and that, and then you end up never doing it. So, um, <laughs> like, one day I was just like, I've had it. And I put on my calendar and all of my team members' calendars half an hour every month for creative time. I was like, as a group, we're going to go down the galleries and like make vines for half an hour. We're going to go down the galleries and do Instagram for half an hour. Like, and the goal is to do something interesting and creative and do it for half an hour because I actually pay attention to what's on my calendar. And so if I put it on my calendar, I'll do it. And so kind of thinking about that sort of stuff like, and what has come out of that it's like it, it may not be an immediate thing of like, and then we save the world. But 
something may come out of it that turns into something really interesting. And so building that into the practice is actually hugely important. That reflection, that time to kind of have unfettered um, risk taking where like if we go down and we make a bunch of vines and they suck, that's okay. Like, you know, nobody's gonna die. So like you know, having that in there and having that space for being able to do things and have it not like be weighty is really, really important. Um, just because at the end of the day, what you'll get is just better stuff than the stuff that really counts. So. Thank you. Yay. Thank you.